Hi guys, it's Miss Maddock here and today I'm going to talk about ptosis or Druby Island. And in order to get the most from this video, please check out my other very short video on eyelid anatomy, if you have not already done so. So without further ado, I will start on this lecture on ptosis. So ptosis is defined as a downward displacement of the upper eyelid. And it is not a diagnosis per se, but a symptom. So you should take a full history and examination if a patient presents with this. And here we see a man with a very apparent left ptosis. We see a very narrow pupillary aperture as the upper eyelid is drooping down. Patients may not present to the doctor with ptosis. Um, they may be embarrassed, they may view it as part of growing old. However, some patients will present, and when they present, they typically may express a cosmetic concern, they don't like the appearance of it, or they may have problems with visual acuity as less light is getting in the eye. Others may even have headache or brow pain, as the eyebrow on the affected side may be more arched to compensate for the ptosis. And some may even have symptoms of the underlying condition causing ptosis. And ptosis can typically be classed into four different categories. It can be congenital, myogenic involving the muscle, neurogenic involving the nerve, or involutional age related. And today I'm going to talk about four particular causes of ptosis that fall into these different categories. And these are involutional, third nerve palsy, Horner's syndrome, and myasthenia gravis. So the first one is involutional ptosis, and this is very common. It is basically the disinsertion of the levator palpebrae superioris, and this is the muscle innervated by the third nerve, ocular motor nerve, and it function is to elevate the eyelid and together with the mother or muscle it will elevate the eyelid the mother muscle plays a smaller role in this it is principally the levator palpebrae superioris so with involutional ptosis this will occur more with age and previous surgery to the eyelids. The second cause I'm going to talk about is Horner's syndrome. And this is a neurogenic cause of ptosis. Um, it is due to the interruption of the sympathetic nervous system. And patients with Horner's syndrome will typically have four key symptoms. Anhydrosis, apparent endophthalmosis, ptosis and meiosis and I will look at those symptoms in more detail. So a Horner's symptom will give a smaller pupil on the affected side and this is because there's disruption of the sympathetic nervous system and this is responsible for dilatation of the eye or pupils rather. Horner's system a syndrome will cause a mild ptosis and can you think why? Perhaps pause the video and have a think. Well, it is because of the interruption of the sympathetic nervous system, which innervates the muller muscle. And the muller muscle is responsible for elevation of the upper eyelid, as we have discussed before, with the levator palpebrae superioris. And the molar muscle is innervated by the sympathetic system, whereas the levator palpebrae superioris is innervated by the third cranial nerve. And this is why you, in Horner's syndrome you, you will get a mild ptosis, because it is the molar muscle rather than the um, levator palpebrae superioris that is affected. And there is also an apparent endophthalmosis um, that the orbit is going inwards. This isn't actually the case, it's more an illusion because of the ptosis. And if Horner's syndrome is congenital, there will also be heterochromia 
with the affected eye being lighter than the non-affected eye. So the eyes are essentially different colours. And this is because iris pigmentation is under sympathetic control prior to two years. And the lack of sweating is also very important sign in Horner syndrome. And intr interestingly, you can classify where the lesion is, the root cause of Horner syndrome, by seeing where there's cessation of sweating. Though this is textbook, but in real life, it mightn't be as accurate. So, if there's no sweating in the head, arms and trunks, Horner's syndrome is likely to have been caused by a central lesion such as stroke, MS. If sweating is limited to the face, it might be caused by neck trauma, surgery or pancreas tumour. And if sweating is limited to the upper face, it is caused by a post ganglionic lesion, such as an internal carotid artery aneurysm. The next very important cause of ptosis that I'm going to talk about is third nerve palsy. And this is a very important sign, so you should not miss it on the ward because third nerve palsy can be the first sign of a posterior communicating aneurysm and it picked up late this can rupture leading to subarachnoid hemorrhage and death and two thirds of untreated posterior communicating artery aneurysms actually rupture. So the aquamotor nerve or the third nerve supplies the levator palpebrae superioris so damage to this nerve will of course give ptosis and third nerve palsies can be split into medical or surgical third nerve palsies. The difference is pupillary involvement. Medical Third nerve palsies are due to diabetes or hypertension which affect the blood supply to the nerve and they will typically be pupil sparing whereas the surgical third nerve palsies will not be. So this is because the pupillomotor nerves are located within the nerves and these are supplied by vessels which remain unaffected in hypertension and diabetes. In surgical nerve th third nerve palsy, there will be compression of the pupillomotor fibres and this will be caused by a posterior communicating aneurysm and there may also be pain as those compression features and the pupil will appear dilated. The final cause that you should be aware of is myasthenia gravis. And this is a myogenic cause. We've discussed two neurogenic causes and we have also discussed an uh, involutional cause. But this one is myogenic and this will cause a variable and fatigue associated ptosis which varies throughout the day. And this is an autoimmune condition caused by autoantibodies against the acetylcholine receptor. And this is quite an uh, important neurological condition, frequently occurs in exams, so it's very good to know quite a bit about this condition. And I will be doing a video on this for my neurology section. So this concludes my video. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and please don't forget forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more medical education videos.